Essentially, this is going to be the form and the void, which is a fascinating topic to, to start with. And I've, I've started off with a, a quote from William Blake. Um, illustrated talk, not just illustrated talk. Um, just a reference to his description up here. If the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear to man as it is, infinite. For well, man has closed himself up until he sees things through narrow chinks of his cavern. Mm -hmm. Now that sort of makes a direct reference back to Plato and Plato's cavern and the fact that we have restricted ourselves, that we are actually impeding ourselves, and the things we've impeded ourselves with are forms or shapes. And he's saying here that we are infinite. And there's Blake's often misrepresented, I think, because he's such a creative person. I don't know whether you can see this. I, I, I didn't have the facility to enlarge this anymore, but it's a, it's a particularly unique. Blake paints in a peculiar sort of way. It's very intense, and I would say it's spiritual, in the sense that the forms are very floaty and drifty, idealized. They glow from within. They don't have to, any shading. He considered shading was a very materialistic thing to do, because it represents three-dimensional reality. And those three beings, you've got a male here with whiskers. You can always tell males, they always have got whiskers. The female is the soul, and the other female is the spirit. Because he considers that, as I say, the quote which goes with this particular illustration is, man has no body distinct from his soul. For that body is a portion of the soul discerned by the five senses. And these are the chief inlets of the soul in this age. What he's saying there is what he's saying in that quote. That we are actually infinite. We are the all. And what condenses us, what limits our structure, what limits the way we look at the world, is the form that we identify with, which is the body. And that, that limitation is what causes all the problems. Uh, Eugene Halliday is the guy that sort of influenced a great number of people here. And he once said to me, really, there's no essential problem for the spirit. It's infinite. And the body can never be saved. When you've got that sorted out, <laughs> everything else is easy. <laughs> the body can't be saved. It's going to die, whatever you do with it. The infinite part of you, the spirit, can't get into any real significant trouble. Where are you going to put your emphasis, in other words? So really the talk is one of emphasis. Where are you going to put your emphasis? And how can you shift your emphasis? Because I think one of the things that we were very lucky with with Eugene is the way he described things was very practical and down to earth. And he was constantly talking about what we had to do and what we have to realize, if we're going to achieve, literally in this lifetime, an understanding of who we are and our relationship to the universe. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay. If you can nod when it's yes, and if you can shake <laughs> so it just helps a lot. You see, because we're talking about concepts which are really quite slippery. The reason for that is we're talking about <coughs> forms and shapes, and they're easy enough to nail down. But the void aspect of it defies all words. 
So when we're talking about it, we're talking in a, a roundabout way, if you like, because there are no words that literally apply to it. You can't define any of the aspects of it. You can only surmise that those things must be apparent in it because they're reflected in this formal world in which we live. And all the information we have about it, all the information that comes across is information. It's shaped again. So I'm going to start with the thing which is really quite important to Halliday's work, and that is that you recognize, he said, and I'm going to put it somewhere up here, that the word form is the Latin for the Anglo-Saxon shape, which is, in Greek, idea, or more mystical, or more specifically, eidos, all the same thing. And he said you can continue that down, because anything with a rule in it is a definition, and the definition is a shape, or a form, or an idea, or an eidos depending on how strict you're going to form them. So if you do that, what we're saying is there is void, there is the nothing, and there, there are shapes, of which we are shapes, our ideas are shapes, everything you can think of, everything you've ever seen, any, every, any mobility at all, any, anything in time or space is a shape. Beyond that, we're postulating that there's a something else. And philosophers have talked about this for a great deal of time. In religion, it's the essence of what the Godhead would be, the thing which is formless. And it's considered philosophically to be one of the aspects of the way we think. That if this whole universe, this whole creation, exists, it presupposes a state prior to it, or it presupposes something out of which it came. Now, science talks about the Big Bang, um, religionists talk about the Godhead that made everything else. Whatever we're talking about, we're presupposing that there was a state when this didn't happen, that it comes from a particular root, that it seems to be developing, and from then we can sort of take it backwards. Now, St. Aquinas very intelligently said, you don't have to believe in a God, but anything you believe, believe that initiated the creation in the first place must be outside of time. It must be outside of shapes. It must be outside of all form. Because you just, if, 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 if God has got a form, or if the creative thing has got a form, then you haven't got to the beginning of creation. It's just another stage. And you're pushing it further and further back. So whether it's Big Bang that you're talking about, or whether it's now they're talking about pre-Big Bang. You know, when I was first learned about Big Bang, there was nothing before it, and suddenly it exploded. There was nothing, and then suddenly it went bang, and it created all this stuff. It had, you know, it, within the first few seconds, it had created, started to create all sorts of, of atomic structures. Now they're saying that, well, there must have been a big crunch before that. So, I mean, whatever happens, if you're talking about a nothing, creating something, it must be outside of time, and, and then you've got these problems of shapes and time and, and forms going back pr prior to that. So the big, the prime mover, as the Greeks used to call it, the thing that kicked everything off, the thing that started everything, must be outside of time itself. So to say there's a God that, that, that's creating things, yes, it's, it's in that sense necessary to have a formless being or a formless something that started all the process up. Otherwise, it comes out of nothing. Now, we're going to play around with the idea of nothing because one or two systems of philosophy have actually said, well, when we're saying nothing, we're actually saying no thing. So we're perhaps, if we think that, if we consider that to be a philosophical proposition, we're talking about not nothing, state of nothingness, but a thing, but something which has no things in it. 
hasn't formed any things yet. So what it is, we cannot describe because we only describe things. So it's an indescribable, but it isn't what we assume to be nothing. That means an emptiness. Or the way the Buddhists say it, it's an emptiness that's full. It's a full emptiness or a pralaroma, a void which is full of everything. Everything which is pouring into this universe. That this universe itself is a limitation which is constantly being fed in this state. And the Buddhists are quite fascinating in this sense because they say not only does things pour into it, but things from this world pour back in, in back into the no-thing as well. Because things are only here for a short period of time. The forms are created and then they dissolve back again into the nothing. Okay? Would it be accurate to describe those <coughs> that preform state or, or the forms before they are <laughs> become a thing? I know it's a bit struggle with the language. Um, potential. Right. Funnily enough, this is one of the, the, the I once used that word with Halliday, mm -hmm. and he said, if you think it's potential, you've got a different level of reality, and he said that will be bad for your head, because you're separating things out in a way, I don't want you to separate them out. Think of them act as actualities which are not energized as intensely. So there are no potentials, they're all actual, but at a level which is less intensely, I energized than the ones that are real, if you like. That way, he'd said, he, he said you, you've got, a, you've got a, um, a gradient or a continuum of reality rather than a different level. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. yeah. There is also this weird conception which um, he talked about. Now, I can't quote this on any particular lecture, but used to talk about the fact that when the universe first creates itself, it creates a pattern structure, which he, can, he actually said was a hexonic eidetic field. And this field itself is perfectly balanced and doesn't move. It's timeless. It's a pattern structure, which is geometry. And he said that space itself is geometrical. Wherever we look, space it acts geometrically. It holds it holds forces and directions and movements into ge geometrical structures. So he said, we must assume that space itself is geometrical. Into that, parts of those geometrical structures seem to come into a, a, a state of existence and then go back in, out again. And we are part of that. When we're outside, we're extant, we exist, and then we insist we go back into this nebulous whatever, the, the pleroma again that we came out of. The Buddha is quite clear about this, that creation is very, very lim limited in the sense that we are only here for a short period of time, and that we have to recognize that. And this is the time that we can work, if you like, while we're extant, because uh, when we're no longer extant, we've gone back into a prolier, into a state of quiescence. And we, this state of ours is dualistic. We have, we're only exhibiting and experiencing one half of it. We also exist in another thing. Saying there's no point in working because we're going back there anyway. We're going back into a structured actuality. Well, that's what's interesting. The, what's the point of working? I'm a bit miffed because we haven't got on the sheet yet and we're starting the questions. <laughs> but why it's interesting is yes, that must be true because God can't work. So why is He interested in us working? But maybe there's a different definition of what work might be, which. Uh, is presumably the, the realm that we're trying to discuss because is there something meaningful that we should be doing since we're only here for a very short period of time what sort of opinions have people brought forward to be the valuable things for us to do okay so I'm going to drag you back to the sheet now because the next thing is about what we do some of the one, the, the good people who managed to come to my yoga or meditation thing, we have a thing called Surya, which is out of fashion now, literally out of fashion. It's called now Yoga Nidra. And it's, it's, it's exactly the same um, function. It's going back into what is called the fourth state. Surya is the fourth state. 
Um, let me just read this, and then we'll try and deal with any issues that come up in this little paragraph. Now, in this fourth state, beyond the dreamless state, you're not an individual. You're identified with the field. Field is the term which Halliday is using for this no thing. It's a term which was really sort of characterized by, by Faraday as an influence, a zone of influence is, is literally the way it's defined, whether that's electrical or magnetic or whatever. A field is a zone of influence. So there is a zone of influence, if you like, which you are identifying when you're identifying with that state. And therefore, you cannot direct yourself individually within it. You are the field. And the field doesn't move in that sense. It is. So if you want to get the benefit of this, the super-individual state, the fourth state, as you cannot determine an individual direction within it, if you want an individual benefit, you'll have to define the benefit you want before you go into the state. That is to say, you will have to set up somewhere within your individual field a resonance which effectively defines what it is that you want to come back. That's Sankalpa. Yeah. What his point is here, and the whole point of that particular talk, as far as I'm concerned, the one on Turia, which has been translated by John, transcribed by John Bailey, who's sitting here, and it's available on the net if you want to get it, freely downloadable if you want it. It's a really fascinating talk by Halliday, and the essence of it is that we have to recognize that we are all these levels at once, because the, the thing, if you like, the workful state or the most sublime state is to be a body and the soul and the spirit simultaneously. In other words, all the levels you can be. And what that, that means is to bring in to this living state the creation of aspects of the known thing. Okay? As to say, you'll have to set up within your individual field a resonance which effectively defines what it is that you want to come back. So, what he's saying is, <coughs> I'm putting this into other jargon now, Turiya is classed as the fourth state. The first state is consciousness, wakeful consciousness. Okay? The second state, and this is from the Manduka Upanishad, we could class as the subconscious. So I'm trying to write in here, okay? The subconsciousness, and that's the things which are influenced by your waking consciousness, and uh, things which are not actually present in your consciousness, but you can call them up quite easily, and that ranges up to the state where you, there are things that you can't call, call back easily, but you can get access to them. And beyond that, we have the unconscious. This is how these definitions, really. In the Manduka, this could, they call it the wakeful state, the sleeping, dreaming state, the dreamless state, the unconscious, and beyond that, we call that as the beyond, is the fourth state, whoops, which is to react. So, what we try and practice is the state of being conscious, and then moving some from the conscious state into the subconscious, when the ideas, instead of being clearly formed, start to fuse. We'd say we're confused. These things fuse together like they do in dreams. One thing will turn into another. Something will, I, I want to say, I always remember, um, I had a wonderful dream in which my father was a brush. I knew it was a brush all the way through my dream, and I referred to him and spoke to him. He didn't speak back, but I knew he was a brush. And then I woke up, I thought to myself, well, what made me know that he was, he was brushed? Because it didn't move, and it didn't say anything, but all through the dream I referenced it. But the fusing together there, the confusing quality of that is the two things are melted together and not separated very clearly. That is the state we recognize as the subconscious moves more towards the unconscious. Those things happen more and more until we cannot separate anything out. It, it becomes more and more fluid, the, 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 the mind and the way it moves, into the state where you are not conscious of any particular distinctions at all. 
these are states which we try and approach in meditation and also in deep relaxation. Beyond <coughs> that is a state where there is not even any sense of separate self, which is what firmly the Turiya is all about. Now in that state, as Halliday is pointing out, there's no individuality at all. So you're moving into a state where you haven't got control anymore, and that means, are you going to come back? Because it's no longer you that's driving the function. What he says is, you are a form within this field. It's endorsing that form. It will bring you back as it would have done had you never got into it. That's a state you go into every night of that sleep. Every human being visits that state regularly on a 24-hour basis. In fact, one of the interesting things he once said is, if you think about it, a third of the world is in that state given at any given time. There's a role of unconsciousness which is going around the globe all the time. You know, So there's a third of us who are tucked up in the land of Nod. But uh, you know, a third of us are at any given moment. Yeah. So, yeah. so as it's rolling around, this is a state which is recognizably part of human awareness. So the fears we have about losing ourselves and immersing ourselves in that are, not, are unfounded. He said. It's far more likely to come back from that. And if you can hold that state, or if you've regularly visited it and can go into it consciously, in other words, knowing what you're doing, you can't control it. But when you come back, the benefits of it can be resonating inside you. Well, how they actually says is, you recognize you're in that state now. This is not something that is only there when you're deep in deep sleep. What's happening in deep sleep is you're rubbing out your conscious mind and your subconscious mind and then your conscious mind, but you're still there. All those layers are still here and now. And the really creative state to be in is to be in all those four simultaneously. So you're actually on, existing on all those levels. He called that reflexively self-conscious at all levels. Okay? So, the waking state, the dream state, the dreamless state, and then the fourth, the surreal state knowing about and knowing. So what I would say is we're separating the two, po the two polarities. Knowing about is a wakeful state. In your wakeful state, you know about things. So that if you see a flower, you can name it, you can tell it's James Pomery, you can tell how it reproduces, you can tell the type of shape of leaves it has. All these are aspects of knowledge, but they're really formed structured information it doesn't it separates you from the thing that you're actually looking at and it's information which has come in from the outside to form you rather than something inside which is the response to the plant the flower there are lots of traditions particularly the Zen tradition and the Chan traditions which are saying that if you wish to actually understand the flower completely you must become it by that they mean you must dissolve who you feel you are and feel into the nature of that so well you understand the structure you understand its beingness so there are two types of knowing knowing from the outside the generous the scientific name how it reproduces all that palaver and the other palaver of actually what it feels like inside to be that particular structure in the world does that make sense so, I mean, I can understand people saying, well, human beings can't do that. Right. But what I'm saying, the idea is important, the very possibility to discuss is important because it must be an experience rather than something that you can act on with a, a, a belief or a non-belief. It, it, for it to be real for you, then it has to be an experience. It has to be something that you can do. Okay? A few people are looking sort of Mystified. Yeah, and uh, all I'm saying is that it, it, it's trying to define the two areas so that we, we've got them distinctly separated. Now, for a while, we're just going to talk now around those sort of postulations. And the next one is I should have learned how to do PowerPoint, you see, and this is my equivalent of PowerPoint, so I've put the pictures of here. It does say long enough, doesn't it? And it saves me going back to school for a bit. 
Load two. It's a lot nicer than PowerPoint. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Obviously, even before we bought 1960. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think it's more sort of uh, aligns itself to a, certainly to a room and hopefully to a group like us. Load two, there he is uh, on his ball. I don't know why he chose to put photographs like that. Is from, they would say, the Chinese uh, tradition is that he's from the 7th century BC, and I still use BC, but I mean before the Christian era, before the common era, sorry. Um, scholarship nowadays say he's only actually probably from the 4th or the 5th century BC, still quite a long time back. And um, the original voice of uh, Taoism. And these are quotes from the Tao Te King. This is the, in the 25th verse. There was something formless and perfect before the universe was born. It is serene, empty, solitary, unchanging, infinite, eternally present. It is the mother of the universe. For lack of a better name, I call it Tao. It flows through all things, inside and outside, and returns. Okay. Now, there's this, and a little bit later I'm going to ask us to, to look at the heart series. There's something about the poetry of that, which says a hell of a lot more than all the words I used before. So all the words to describe it, if you like, are not as effective, I don't think, as it's stimulating us as the way that just resounds with silence. Does that make sense to people? Because if it's true what I'm saying, then you will feel it. You will not understand the sort of the void in the same way as you understand the plants and the genus and all that sort of stuff, or what I'm saying in the words and the form of this room. You understand it in a different way, and it's a felt response. It's not an emotional response, it's a felt. It, 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 it's, it, it comes at you substantially, and I mean by substantially, it's the, it's the very basis of you. Because what these guys are talking about is that that no thing, the emptiness, is actually the consciousness itself. Not the things it's conscious of, but the actual quality, the space in which everything happens. If you think of consciousness as a space in which everything happens, your, your emphasis shifts from the things you're conscious of to the very quality of consciousness itself, what it is. And as an experience, I would say it's a space in which things happen, whether it's reading, whether it's watching a play, conversation, whether it's a form, it's usually a form, but it can also be a feeling state. The actual watcher or experiencer of that is a space, is the closest you'll get to it. It's a feel rather than a being. And if you can understand that that thing itself is, is itself got every shape inside it, but it hasn't got a shape, that's why it's impossible to to uh, to really nail it down with a definition. We the consciousness. So we say it, it can't act. It cannot act in itself, it acts in the world, inside the universe. And it, it, there's nothing inside it in that sense. Well, we can't even discuss it, John, is what they say. So they assume if it wants to, to do anything, it does it here. It does it in the realm of the, of the created, if you like, inside the universe. It certainly influences consciousness. It pours into it all the time, yeah. And that the consciousness is always outside. It, it's not outside in terms of its, of its presence, but the awareness itself is always outside of any situation it's looking at. Yeah. And in that sense, it's also outside of any conception that you might have of it. So it's the one thing which is extremely slippery and very difficult to get to because it's always behind anything or bigger and bigger than anything you can say about it or can conceive of, you know. So what these guys are saying is, well, if we allow that to be the very warp and weft of the universe, the very fabric, the substance on which the universe is written, that stands on that, 
it seems to be nothing, but it's extremely positively powerful because everything comes out of it and goes back into it. But these words cannot really be ascribed to it because it is a no thing. You know, we can say this about it, and that's just like somebody saying, well, actually, he's a very kind old gentleman with a white beard, and he does actually love us because he, what they're actually saying, he's like a father, which if you say, you know, if you can see that abstractly, it doesn't make any sense unless you say, well, that thing is exactly the same as Halliday saying, well, it created us in the first place. So if you do dissolve into it, it's going to resolve you back again after a certain time. You can trust it to do that. And if you're going to trust it, it's, a, it's only one step away to say it's behaving like a good father. Not like the ones we have, but like a good one. I'm just, I'm just, just quoting the, the fact that uh, most people, you know, parents have shortcomings. This one is meant to be the one that actually does, or as when uh, Stephen Mitchell, the guy who, who, who translates this Tao Te Ching, constantly uses the word the great mother for this because he says it's more like a great mother the way the Chinese describe it than a great father. But we're talking, we're giving human attributes to something which is beyond human attributes. We're attaching them to suggest that because we are, if you like, its children in some sense, it will then tend to allow us some some extent to add some kindness and some positivity. It will work with us, if you like, to slowly unfold all the potentials of its own being. Because it's only through us that it realizes itself. It's only literally our awareness of it that's in, that will feed back into it in, fact, in that sense as consciousness. As we conceive of it, it's reflected back into it. So we are an important aspect of the universe in that sense. Our consciousness is a separable part of that and a unique evaluation in that sense. Wherever we look, we don't see, we see forms, but we don't see any consciousnesses reflecting them back unless we look at each other. That this human realm does seem to have an extent and a, a diversity which is meaningful in its consciousness more than anything else. We're not distinguished by our shapes and by our abilities to run or whatever else or our abilities to do anything other than to be conscious and to reflect this world back at itself. That's the one thing that we seem to do which machines aren't doing yet. Okay, I talk on the prescription of two types of knowing and understanding as a distinct human experiences which have fundamentally very different and very separable properties and purposes. So we're saying so far that there are two states. There's this, this, the in the world state and ultimately there's the non-state which I'm suggesting is the consciousness which is looking at the world. But the consciousness is not in the world but is always out of it, observing it, which is the other essence of Eugene's point. The observer is not the observed. You know, in that sense, if he's distinct from it, always outside of the situation. So are you saying uh, the no thing is conscious? The no thing is the consciousness. Yes, is the consciousness. Yes, yes. But what it's conscious of is the things at all different levels, yes. Yeah, no. That it gives itself, it's making those things. We're certainly conscious in us, but whether it's only conscious in us, we don't know. And ultimately, I don't even know whether you lot are conscious. I, mean, I know I am. It's an experience of itself, which is the great solipsistic problem. You know, there are people who have argued philosophically that you can never know that other beings are conscious. It's one of those great problems. You can, because you cannot tell whether someone is responding creatively to you. To you. It's one of the big problems in um, the Asimov talks of with the, the fact of uh, with automatons. How could you possibly know whether you're dealing with a machine or not? And uh, they've actually designed all sorts of questions which the machine would not be able to answer, but it's just to do with the level of sophistication. You can never be sure is the ultimate answer to that. So how would you prove that somebody else is conscious? I think there was a very famous murderer called Dan that was actually trying to look for consciousness when he cut people's heads off and tried to find it. <laughs> and he couldn't find it, so he said he was justified completely in using the right machine. You talking, he said um, that someone had said to him, oh, well, it's normal an illusion. He said, so I just kicked him on the shin and said, is that an illusion? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. There's always that. Knowing, not knowing, knowing, not knowing. And somewhere in the middle of that, there 
awareness of consciousness, be still mm. and know when I pray, I speak to God. When I meditate, can be still, God speaks to me. The silence comes the through. Silence. It's out of the silence that comes to your creativity, but it doesn't come, it only comes into situations, if you like. Um, we don't know it in the void. What we know in the void is the silence and the stillness, but we then use that in the world. It uses itself, it uses us coming into the world. So if you like, we're on this cusp, to use a astrological term, we're on this, this skin between the conscious network and literally the real world in which these things can be formed and, and shaped and things. I just wondered where choice would might come in in this. Right. Because it was like it uses us but also we have the ability to choose as well. So. Yes, but in, in talking about it like that, we've separated us from it. There couldn't be any separation in the sense where the conscious part of us is it mm -hmm. in this place. Mm -hmm. So, whatever it does to us, it does consciously to itself. So, the choice is, is always inherent in that conscious level. Okay. So, it's like Christ saying, He's the Son of God, which means He's God. When you see me, you see God made manifest. He looks like this when He's walking about on this planet is what he's saying. And you won't see him in any other form like that, other than in a form, because the no thing doesn't represent itself anywhere. But he's still saying there is a level of reality to that which you can perceive, but you can't perceive it like you can perceive other people. And your level of choice in that sense, the mechanism that you set in, in, in process is constantly being interfered with with your consciousness. And that consciousness is the same consciousness the God consciousness, if you like, or the big consciousness. Because even to call it God is to give it a personality. It wouldn't even have a personality if it wasn't the world there to reflect it. The world is its personality working itself out. Okay? That's one of the things that's very difficult to talk about. It. Unless you personalize it, you give it all these qualities, and then say, well, it allows us to choose. Well, it doesn't allow us to choose. It's us choosing. It's in us choosing all the time. And so if you can actually hold those four levels all at once, then you're doing that. And you recognize that you're inflicting these things on yourself. And you're playing rather than that's working. That's self-realization. Yeah. And that's the state of grace uh, when there is no personal gain, when the, the instrument would act purely from that divine level. Yeah. And so there wouldn't be any work when Gordon said the word work. It's immediately sort of suggests that it, this, it, it, it's achieving a state and it, it's taking a great deal of energy to lift it to that state. The, the whole part of that process would be, a, it can only be described as something which is enjoyable for its own sake because it's not getting anywhere. God is the Alpha and the Omega, so he can't, he can't actually progress. He can't develop other than to allow it to the understand joys itself. The yeah. And that is the, if you like, charm state of being able to involve yourself timelessly in any moment. As far as I'm concerned, that timelessness means you're not thinking about why you're doing it. And it isn't for an end product. That might be guiding the whole process. But if you're not enjoying it as it's in this state now, then you're not living in this moment. You've got an end progress in this, so you're, you're working in a way that is non-complete into its own immediacy. The whole thing about immediacy of Zen seems to me to be talking about the fact that you have to do something because of the enjoyment of the state of being as it is now, not what it's going to be like in, you know, in the future. That will shape it, but it doesn't govern the process as it is now, other than uh, something to aim for. It's a very long question, answer rather to a question about choice. Yeah, is it? Could you sum that up? No, no, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when we say choice, we're actually allowing that there are potential form forms to, to choose between. Um, in that state, it wouldn't feel like a dilemma. It wouldn't feel like 
this or that, it would feel like flowing into what was next. That would be the, 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 the thing because the consciousness itself would be coming in. If that is everything, remember it's not a potential as hard as you're saying, it's actual, it's just that it's so subtle we cannot access it without a great deal of work because we're being trained to focus literally on this substantial level of this nitty gritty. I've always felt that flowing into as, as love flowing into manifestation. You know? mm -hmm. Yep. I mean, it has to be because it's developing itself through that a loving state. But then we're coming back to, to talking about a loving father again, and that's a postulation and a personalization which is maybe a step too far for some people. And they'd say, well, yeah. Love in then that sense is humanizing it. You know, it, it, if you tell, it's a helpful in that it's, it's trying to create. So it's a creative rather than they might might choose to, to describe it. But, but there is an ultimate choice, isn't it? Either to uh, choose to have your own the individual private terms mm -hmm. and have work on that, or to have the will of the Father, which you just described, work through you. So if, you're, if your will is to do the will of the Father you sent, yeah. Then, then that's, that's the flow that you're talking about. But otherwise. Are you assuming well, then that he doesn't flow through you if you don't give him that permission? He'll flow through you anyway. You can't get away from it. He's <laughs> always good. Uh, yeah. Be happy. <laughs> this is what you seem, you seem to be saying there's something fundamentally, fundamentally misleading about the idea of choice. Yes. And we bring a whole pile of baggage to it. We do. Yeah. yeah. And I don't think, in, at that level, it would be a problem because you wouldn't be separating yourself from the thing which was acting through you. Yeah. It is you anyway, and it is acting through you even now, but you don't think it is. And the only thing that, that is generated there is a resistance, perhaps, to the things that happen to you. And maybe that's the essence of the egoic state. That it's literally this, this identifying with this egoic state which separates you from it in that way. And the fact that we're trying to preserve something which uh, is not, not ours to preserve, we didn't create in the first place, and it's going to go poof at the end anyway. And when it goes poof, we haven't really got all that much control over it. You're saying we didn't create it at the ego level. That's right. Right, okay, that's fine. Mm -hmm. I yeah. will take you up on that. You have to constantly do this. I mean, I know it sounds a fiddle, but you do because it is created. So that means yeah. you've caused all your own problems yeah. anyway. You put yourself here. It's all your own fault. Yeah. <laughs> now, how well, say what, what we're trying to repair yeah. is a karmic thing. Mm. This is a dance of karma, really. Yeah. Um, I was talking to a guy the other day. We were talking about the fact of that we even focus onto this world because there's a lot of, of psychiatrists who and psychologists who think what we call the everyday mind, that this ego state, is actually a state of hypnosis. It's a state of reduced awareness. Mm. It's a state where you know we're not handling all the nervous impulses which are coming to us anyway. And we know this, you know, we can measure the amount of impulses that are coming through and we're screening out most of it. Um, we talk about the fact that um, you know the uh, the the ear for instance, eighty percent of the, the sound that we hear is structured by the brain. So we're li we're actually hearing things that we're waiting for. It, 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 that sounds like a, a contradiction in terms, but it's the way the brain is. It structures itself to hear the sounds it wants to hear. It screens out so much information, and it analyzes and, and gives a shape to the sounds that it's actually hearing. That's why when you hear something, and my dear wife says something to me, and I, when it first comes at me, I, I, I get a scramble for all sorts of things like, you know, is that rhinoceros dead? And I think, I can't. Right, and then I realised she actually said, "I'm going up to bed." And then, <laughs> but there's a delay, and you can hear it. Now, it's far more subtle than that. And I mean, I, I, I'm being bluntly uh, facetious there. But we are structuring sound all the time, and that literally, we we know that we are hearing things and screening them out. There's a great deal of psychological experimentation which has allowed that. You know, certain words are very dangerous to people and they can't hear them. They can't hear, hear them in an everyday situation. And we know that their bodies have heard them because their blood pressure is, is going through the roof. 
but they haven't heard it. They can only easily do this on a telephone. You know, but, um, you, you can actually slide these words in under the gate of, of awareness, and the person is responding, but they haven't actually heard that word. And we can give them lie detectors, and they haven't heard that word. So it's, um, it's a very strange structuring that we do and limiting of what we're prepared to accept as the, the real world. You know, there's a lot of vibrations which we are aware of, yeah. and which we don't actually allow ourselves to see or hear. We limit them right there. And as Eugene said, continuous stimulation is no stimulation. If you've seen something regularly every day, you stop looking at it, you stop seeing it, and it, it, it just becomes screened out of you. It has to sort of be on fire before you'll ever recognize it again or see it again. Okay, here's Halliday talking about, let's see, the Father as being the thing which puts us here. There is a primordial power source for every being, and with this primordial power source is called the Father. The Father is simply the corrupt form of the word made of two parts, put here, pater, pater, pitri. All those fundamental words mean to put here. Who put us here? Who put anybody here? Who put anybody here? Answer, energy did so. But the energy is sentient. The energy vibrates. There is no non-vibrating energy in the universe. Wherever science looks, it finds vibratory structures of energy. Okay. Imagine that science is deficient today only in one thing. It does not attribute sentience to energy. When it does so, it will solve a lot of problems, psychologically, psychological and somatic. There is an infinite vibratory field of energy which in its vibrations structures itself. The vibrations interfere with itself. By sentience, it means that word feeling. That's just the old Latin form of it, to, the sentience, to actually feel, to be aware. It, we we recognize it mostly in our bodies. We feel touch in that sense. But it, it, there's a sensitivity even within that. We feel emotional states as movements inside ourselves. We feel this flow, ebb and flow of, of feeling as a toward or, a, or, or an away from fluctuation of energy, it's vibrational. And we can feel a tone in vibration as well. We, we can feel a mood change in the person next to us. We can certainly feel it in, in ourselves. But we are also aware of these vibrations in other people, which um, is now being scientifically measured, apparently. So these states are responsive states. Below the threshold of thought, but they can be brought into thought. We can name them and call them up. But if we get too abstract, we deal with the names and with the, with the, with the forms, and we don't visit the feeling state itself. Visiting the feeling state puts us back into reality. That's part of the, of the, of the process. Right. A very old description here of what we're talking about. This is from the, from the Buddhist um, discipline. It's the Heart Sutra, and I actually think it's a very, very powerful piece of work. Um, I've got the picture of the Dalai Lama there, mainly because it's his, it's not his, his translation, excuse me, this was a translation which was put by Dr. Bori, I think. I haven't put it in there, I'm, I'm sorry about that. He, he's done the one who's, um, see more pictures? I've got to do this. This is my, uh, gives me existence, makes me, gives me energy as well to move around the room. Um, here's Lanzu, and here's Dalai Lama, merely because what we've done here is we've actually his interpretation of the last mantra at the end. He describes it um, in a very su succinct manner. Now, has anybody heard the Heart Sutra before? Yeah. Yeah, if you go to a Zen session, usually they'll chant it. Um, I'm just going to, to go through it now. and. Uh, Again, as with the, the Lao Tzu, although it's translated into English, the translators seem to bring through a feeling 
which comes through the words and um, to me that is that uh, that is part of that experiencing yourself at the levels which this is trying to talk to because what must inherently be apparent is if we're saying that forms are fixed rigid condensed if you like or frozen consciousness. If there is only consciousness in this whole scheme of things, then we can consider it that literally the different states of energy or the different states of, of, of consciousness. If it's that awareness formed into a fixed thing so it becomes unconscious of itself by being unlinked to its own voidity, we can say that the shapes and the forms are frozen consciousness and that you know the different levels of thoughts are, are just more, more freedom more and more abilities to, to relate being uh, actually released in it. And so we're feeling in this sort of state that those states are all conceivable and um, experienceable in us now when we allow ourselves to quieten down and not th see things logically linked or structured together, but it written down by somebody who was in that state when he created this piece of work. Does that make sense? In other words, from a feeling state, if you can create something like this, then presumably, in a listener, or in a sayer, or in a reader, you can recreate that state as they go through it, which is the essence to me of poetry. You're trying to trigger off the feeling state that triggered off the poem in the first place, not by any logical description, but by using words which have a potency and a vibration and a rhythm that hits them in the same place. Yeah? Yeah. First word, of course, is a doozy. Avalokiteshvara, the Bodhisattva of compassion, meditating deeply on perfection of wisdom, saw clearly that the five aspects of human existence are empty, and so released himself from suffering. Answering, answering the monk Sariputra, he said this: "Body is nothing more than emptiness." Emptiness is nothing more than body. The body is exactly empty, and emptiness is exactly body. The other four aspects of human existence, feeling, thought, will, and consciousness, are likewise nothing more than emptiness. And emptiness is nothing more than death. All things are empty. Nothing is born, nothing dies, nothing is pure, Nothing is stained, nothing increases and nothing decreases. So in emptiness there is no body, no feeling, no thought, no will, no consciousness. There are no eyes, no ears, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind. There is no seeing, no hearing, no smelling, no tasting, no touching, no imagining. There is nothing seen, nor heard, nor smelled, nor tasted, nor touched, nor imagined. There is no ignorance and no end to ignorance. There is no old age and death and no end to old age and death. There is no suffering, no cause of suffering, no end to suffering, no path to follow. There is no attainment of wisdom and no wisdom to attain. The Bodhisattvas rely on the perfection of wisdom and so with no delusion that they feel no fear and have nirvana here and now all the Buddhas, past, present, and future, rely on the perfection of wisdom and live in full enlightenment. The perfection of wisdom is the greatest mantra. It is the clearest mantra, the highest mantra, the mantra that removes all suffering. This is the truth that cannot be doubted. Say it so. Gate, gate, paragate. Parasam gate, body, svaha. And this is the Dalai Lama's trans transcription of it. Go, go, go beyond. Go thoroughly beyond and establish yourself in enlightenment. Okay? There's a little, I've put some footnotes here. Um, 
um, the Dalai Lama has explained that <coughs> the last Sanskrit part of the Sutra, the mantra, is an instruction for practice and translates it as go, go beyond, go through beyond, and establish yourself in enlightenment. Thus, as four transcending actions, go, go, go beyond, go thoroughly beyond. So there's four goes there to an ultimate achieve and established state. That's from his discourse on the heart sutra. I don't think it's any coincidence that he says go four times. There are four levels of going. You're going through all these particular states to get to this fourth state of being, which is beyond all of those. That sounds like a, a tremendous great dollop of nihilism there. But see, there's nothing standing at the end of that. It takes down everything you've ever sort of sheltered in. You know, there's no ignorance, no end to ignorance. There's no old age and death, no end to old age and death. No suffering, no cause of suffering, no end to suffering, no path to follow. It slices away everything that you might have actually rested on. Any crutch you think you've got, it wants to kick away. And then it says, but still, go. It's you. There is still you after all that has gone. You are still. There is still beingness behind when all that is gone. The void itself is still there, and the void itself is being. Does that make sense? I understand that's not every. They're elemental parts, but only to their sub assemblies. Now the watch wakers were each distributed at the same, each disturbed at the same rate, once per hundred assembly operations. However, due to the different assembly methods, it took Mekos 4,000 times longer than Bios <laughs> to complete a single watch. The last line is meant to hit you like a sledgehammer, which I remember when I read it, it did, you know. And you suddenly realize that this idea of little having units of self-organization is a fascinating one. And it's an incredibly powerful one in terms of evolution and in terms of all systems that you've ever seen. Now, from that sort of analysis, I mean, he prides himself as being a very good mathematician. Um, what he, he then ex he extrapolates from that uh, is a very, very important <coughs> idea. And I find it fascinating because of what it allows you to do. Um, I've come across it in, in a little bit in, in Bertrand Russell. That's me talking there about where and how he came from. Uh, but Kessler really does make it make it dance. He, in the rest of the book, he plays with this, this concept. And he calls it the whole lot. Um, okay. um, so if I read that little bit, uh, over here. Oh, the, the very last page you've got is, uh, you should have a copy of the, um, the thing about Bios and Mechos. You've got the page from his book, in other words. So page eight is the book, uh, close copy from my copy of it. Um, seems to be based on logical atoms of birth and birth in the early 20th century. Um, but it, it's used by Kessler to show that the hierarchical organization of systems is an inbuilt feature of life, biological life. And also, universal, universalized to a, any complex evolving system, where not only is the time needed for the development great and shortened when hierarchical methods are used, but there are also inherent benefits in terms of maintenance, regulation, and restoration. Wheels Within Wheels, which is another way of describing this and talking about this. But I think what he does is he actually puts, he puts it in place in, in quite a unique way. I think Russell talks about the fact that if we're talking about things, we have to stop at a certain level because there's another subject underneath which deals with it. So it, his big thing is if you're talking about physics, it's okay until you come to a certain level of the atom, then you're actually talking about chemistry. And of course, it's same, you can start above that with biology. That is essentially physics put into living, living creatures, etc. So he said, he, you know, he says you have to stop at a certain level because you drop into a different subject, and there are different. It's a different discipline, and different types of logic then apply, to different types of um, assessment, and um, different proofs of facts are, are accepted. But what Kessler does, he said, but have you not noticed that everything is actually part and a whole at the same time? And that's the thing that, when I, I first came across it, I mean, it fits into what Halliday is saying really, really quite well, I feel, anyway. And it's not, it's not just in biology, for instance, it's, it's everywhere. He notes in an Alfred Hayes short story about the accidental death of a child. Because we 
we always think of things happening in some sort of succession, and then we say because, thinking that the, the because explains. And then you examine the because, as I have done oh so many times, and it opens up, and inside there's another because, smaller, a because inside the other because, and you keep opening them, and they keep disclosing other becauses. Infinite regression is not the invention of philosophers. Okay? That when you look at the world, you find that there are smaller causes that are embedded in the cause that you think that is causing it. And inside them, there's other causes, and, and then you find that there's no end, literally, to this. The idea of the whole occupies the central position of Kessler. Kessler's thinking about the human condition. He developed the construct to deal with three central problems. The the need for a model that could unite and integrate the mechanistic worldview of the behavioral psychologies, with the holistic and humanistic worldview of the Freudians, the Rogerians, and the Gestalt psychology. In other words, he was very concerned about the state of psychology at that particular time. But he also wanted to provide some theoretical system that would apply evolutionary conceptualizations to both these realms, and to develop a model of human social systems that was equally at home in analyzing the micro level of individual of individuality and the macro level of the collectivity and synthesizing things. The first universal characteristic of hierarchies is the relativity and indeed the ambiguity of the term part and whole when they're applied to any of the sub-assemblies. It's the very obviousness of this feature that makes us overlook its implications. A part, as we generally use the word, means something fragmentary and incomplete, and a whole is considered as something complete in itself and needing no further explanation. But wholes and parts in this absolute sense just do not exist anywhere, either in the domain of living organisms or in social organisms, is italics. And he goes down even in physics, you know, it's very difficult to find something which is complete and whole, uh, which isn't actually a part of something else. This whole on construct had, in fact, a very venerable and ancient ancestry in Western philosophy. Several important philosophers, including Leibniz, Hegel, and Russell, had drawn attention to the importance of such things as hierarchy and the complexity of the relational and development levels it reveals. It can bring together different areas of knowledge and modes of scientific investigation, extensively ongoing specialization that has characterized modern science. Whole on theory was Kessler's attempt at an interview to the philosophy of science and his hope that something like whole on theory would form the basis for a truly holistic future worldview. Now, in some miraculous way, that illustration there, which is of the god, the, it's a Roman illustration of the god Janus, the god of January, and Janus looks into the past year and into the future year, and he says he's using the, the idea of a whole lot as a literally um, a duper duplex of a concept. He wants us to think of it as a whole and a part simultaneously. That's why he's called it a whole lot. And he wants us to think of it like a particle, which is whole in itself and also a part of something else. And he then goes on to say, everything you can think of is a whole in one area and a part simultaneously. They're not separable, is his point. It's a philosophical point, um, but I find it fascinating in terms of where it puts things together. So the whole process of inner formulation inside the finite depends upon this. Sorry, I've gone on to Halliday again. Right, just let me finish on what it's saying there, because if you go down to the footnote at the bottom of the page, the word is a combination of the Greek holos, meaning whole, with the suffix on, which, as in proton and neutron, suggests a particle or a part. The whole on, there's a whole on then, is a part whole. It is a nodal point in the hierarchy that describes the relationship between entities that are self-complete wholes and entities that are seen to be other dependent parts. As one's point of focus moves up and down and or across the nodes of a hierarchical structure, so one's perception of what is a whole or what is a part will also change. He calls them Janus headed, facing two ways. They face inside and they face outside simultaneously. So a human being is a whole, part of humanity, part of any social structure that you care to name, a church, a, a factory or whatever. So they're a part of that, 
but also a hole in themselves. And if you look at them, they're made of parts. They're made of organs, and those organs are made of parts, which are made of cells, all of which we can, uh, are simultaneously a hole in one area and also a part in another. What he's saying is that wherever the mind goes, uh, which I think is what Halliday is pointing out as well, is wherever you look, or wherever you look at a shape, you find that its shape is actually governed by two things. The hole that, that it makes with its own, the, the unities that it makes with every uh, other situation it's placed in, or the things it's a part of, and also the organs, if you like, which are organizing it on the inside. So this idea is what Halliday would say. He's saying that all these forms are actually made of we don't know. Because ultimately, when you analyze a shape, you find it's made of, of other shapes, but it's actually something which is shaped. And if you look at what it is that's shaped, you find smaller things, smaller shaped things which are inside it. And they're all behaviors which are patterned in a structured way, but what the behaviors are, we don't know because wherever we look smaller again, we find that it's made of something which is smaller again, which is made of parts which are smaller again. And we keep on going down until we've got a great big hadron collider where we're trying to find the even smaller particles which are smaller again than that. And so what Halliday's saying, and if you like, what the Heart Sutra is saying, is that these forms are made of a void. It's a void which is moving. It's shaped, but it's nothingness. I mean, remember, working out once, the, the relative sizes, which it was, it was described in, in miles, and it said that, I think they were talking about hydrogen atoms, and they said that if the hydrogen atom was the size of a beach ball, sorry, if the nucleus was the size of a beach ball, the electron would be 34 miles away. And between them, there was nothing. Now we think of the substance of ourselves as being made of something which is tangible and solid. But that tangible solid is actually the force field, because if you say the, the real things, the nucleus and the electrons, are literally made of space. And now, of course, we're going inside of them, and, and how, but we've been going inside them for a long time and finding that there's even more space inside them. And there's behavior, patterns of behavior that constructs them. And they've even all got charges on them, but the thing is that we're trying to analyze keeps on going smaller and smaller. And building up and up and up, we're finding that what we thought was a universe is actually only part of an even bigger structure, which is also seems to get, keep on getting bigger and bigger wherever we look. So there's no fixed end, there's no shape thing which is made of a something, which isn't also a shape thing which is made of a something which is made of a shape thing. Or so these things are infinitely small and infinitely large at the same time. And the substance of them seems to just be patterned energy all the time. And when we look at the pattern, it's made of even smaller patterns. We haven't yet, we don't know what it is that they're all made of. And of course we couldn't know because there's only really shape when we look at it. The force of it is literally the movement. It's shaped the patterns of force that the things occupy. The fields of magnetic force are actually patterned, they're designed, they move iron filings in a particular shape. So we're talking all the time about shaping something that we don't know what it is. And that something, that reality is made of a something. So when someone comes along and says, the something that it's made of is literally crystallized consciousness. That's all it is. It's consciousness holding a form, holding a pattern, holding a shape, and repeating that so we can actually measure it to some degree. Does that make sense? The whole long thing is a really beautiful idea, it is, isn't it? I'm sure, I'm sure it can be found in the ancient world. It's an idea that goes a long, long way back. I'm sure I've heard echoes of it. Right. But as you talk about it, it strikes me that it's some sort of key to understanding the, this dilemma that modern physics has got itself in with the uh, 
uh, like classical physics for the sort of macro world, mm -hmm. and then the, the uh, quantum physics, and they're, they're different, and they don't know quite how to put them together. They, yeah. they know they fit together, but they, it seems to be in this part whole, whole long kind of way, doesn't it? Or it that yeah. sort of intuitively feels like that to me as you talk about it. Yeah, I'm only, I'm only reading it from a layman's point of view, so, but it, it does certainly seem to be like that. But more and more they're finding that molecules seem to be behaving in a sort of a, in a quantum, me a quantum way, um, which again comes back to this, to this field uh, this concept. So the whole idea of the, this sort of um, possibility realm, the whole sort of Schrodinger thing, seems to play directly into this area. It's not an area that I know myself very well, so I tend to avoid it. But um, in terms of the philosophy of something like that, you can state something like that and then sort of say, well, does it make sense? Because to me, it seems to just remove things to a different level of analysis. You know, So what we're talking about always are forms of something of which we do not know. So we, we, you know, we talk blindly about things like electricity without really because when you look at it, you find it's a flow of things rather than anything else. And in, in that way, you're talking about a structured pattern again. So the thing itself is, is what? You know, the, the very quantum of which we're trying to get down to seems to disappear through our fingers, if you like. And whether that's a necessary part. I mean, there are what, what, what Buddhism seems to deliberately say is that this is the structure of the mind. So really, it's your mind that ties yourself in knots like this. There's a wonderful quote. I couldn't find it. I was looking for it. There were two monks, and um, one says, <laughs> one finds the other one stirring, and they've got one of those um, pennants on top of the on top of the temple. And then he, he said, "What are you staring at?" He said, "I'm trying to work out whether the, it's the pennant that's, that's waving, or it's the wind that's waving." And of course, the answer is neither of them. Your mind is waving. <laughs> Eternity, you know, is, is still and it, it's con constantly completing itself. What you're experiencing is a mental adaptation. You're actually understanding it in a particular way, which is limiting your, con your conception of what's going on. Now, that is a koan. The whole origin of koans is not to give you a logical explanation. If you understand it, it hasn't worked. The idea of the koan is to smash the way you think, because you see that universe just doesn't seem to actually answer the questions in the way that we normally think about it. So a koan doesn't work if you feel you understand it. It's, meant, it's designed to, to block your rational mind and, uh, and make you think in a different way. Make you jump out of it into the no mind. I mean, all formulation, they would say, all thought process, processes, they would say are forms um, and how they would say lightly held reality. So how they would say, if you've got things, the G at the end tells you that they're substantial. If you've got things, the K tells you, the K is a glottal stop which is not pushed as hard as the G. There's a soft glottal stop. And if you force that, then you actually put your glottis in the right place, you go <coughs> And that, that shift there is the intensity of the difference between the different levels of holding. You can whisper things. You can't whisper things. Because the thing turns into a when you whisper it. That's why he said the angels don't talk, they only ever whisper. So there are lots of consonants that you can't say when you whisper because they're closes and they imply, they imply substantial manipulation of the glosses. So you could say literally, you've got those two, those two shifts there between that word tell you the difference of, of you know, actual energy intensity when you're talking about my mental th forms and physical forms. And the, um, the process in that sense, you could actually say, is beyond that, you've got the non-thought, non-thinking, but still being, feeling level, which he, was, he would say, the Buddhist called no mind. That's beyond thinking. But you're still there, but you're not thinking in terms of forms. So if you call mental forms the mind, and then you have to describe something when you're no longer thinking. Now Sartre said this. Sartre said that the very idea of being conscious of something is not the same idea as thinking about forms in consciousness. 
that it's a different, it's a shift <coughs> of level, it's a different gear, which is the same as saying, at that level there, it's not the same as having forms inside. There's a different state of being. And at that state of being, you can't lock yourself into it. That's why he was trying to get out of the eternal return. You know, if you're conscious of yourself, you can say, okay, I'm, I know I'm conscious. Now I know that I know that I'm conscious. And do I know that I know that I know I'm conscious? But there's a, that's an infinite regression. There's a wonderful story by, by Beckett called Malone Dies, and Malone knows that he's there. And then he knows that he knows that he's there. <laughs> he knows that he knows that he knows he's there. And that infinite regression drives him mad in the, in the book. And the, 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 whole con the whole story about Beckett is all about these cons consciousness end games, these traps that your consciousness can take itself into. Because it's constantly formulating itself as consciousness. What Halliday and what the, the Zen characters say, well, consciousness can never actually think itself it'll never appear in its own projection, you know. We are behind the camera, or we're behind the projector, so looking at the screen. The screen itself is not consciousness. It's way behind it. They're in a level which is always looking, and never on the screen. Whatever you've got on your screen might be a pretty healthy idea and work for you in one context, but in other contexts it'll be completely wrong. You can never get that consciousness on the screen. What you get on the screen are actors, as Halliday would say, or acts. An actor is something which acts. So the something which acts is never the consciousness. It, is, it comes out of the void, but as soon as it's in the void, out of the void, into reality, it's then an act like everything else, and then it's got, it's got a shape, and so it's not what it was that created it in the first place. You have to hold mentally gymnastics and hold yourself in the state of pre-being. And it's possible, and it's an experience, but it is only an experience, it's not a thought process, and you can't trap it in words. You can indicate it, so they have this wonderful imagery of somebody pointing at the moon, and I'll, I'll look at it, but saying, the thing that points at the moon is not the moon. No, it's not the monkey jumping. Yeah, and the reflection, the constantly uh, images of reflection. Kessler commit suicide. Yes. Well, I'm trying to equate that sort of clarity as well. Yeah. With a man who commits suicide. Yeah. Reminds me of the Cohen. Well, he had he had something like he had some progressive illness, which he knew that he didn't have much long much long so. left. Yeah. So he was quite. Uh, there he is there. With the two blondes. And um, that's the way to do it. He. Uh, <laughs> That's one of the contentious things. His wife, who was much younger than him and didn't have a, a serious illness, also committed suicide with the same drugs. You know, when you were talking then, on, it just re reminded me of a Cohen that we had put up in the in the loo at Faith House, and it said, "Give your bones back to your father and your flesh back to your mother, and show me your true face." <laughs> <laughs> it was the only time when people really read him. <laughs> in the, in the <laughs> <laughs> I can well imagine that as well. Mm. Uh, the only one I can repost to that one is Hartley once said to me, people don't people don't realise that God's everywhere. That means he's at the bottom of the, the toilet. toilet I've <laughs> to to told you we were, we were never able to go to the toilet after eating. And then I said, I trust you, Lord. <laughs> I think we've got to sort of go on to, there's a, there's a, a few more quotes there from Halliday, which are uh, interesting, and then we've ne we're nearly done on that. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump down to the very last two paragraphs, actually, just to read this, um, and then throw it open to, to any questions that we've got. So now if, I'm at, I'm at the very bottom of page, uh, very last two paragraphs of page seven. Now if we accept that no matter what definition we start with, if we declare it, that is to make it clear, we will necessarily, in the act of clarifying it, begin to expose a self-contradiction. What he's saying is all these forms here are self-contradictory because they're made, they're designed in plus and minuses. 
So there's a separation. When the universe creates, it's usually, it's usually described as separating itself out from either thing and space or positive and negative or yin and yang or whatever. Because when we think, we think in terms of a binary, binary split. Uh, we can't conceive of something which is just a unity without something outside of the unity. And so we're always fasting things together. Form and void are, se again, a separate a separa separation, which, of course, necessarily are a, must be a unity. But how can we describe that? We can't even think about it because it would, have, it would be shapeless. So we're back again into this weird conception of the way our minds think. It might be possible for someone who doesn't have a, a binary structure inside their brains to, to conceive of it, but it's very, very difficult for a human being. Um, this self-contradiction is the ground of the necessity um, for giving up the individual as such. Remember that when a center broadcasts to a limit, this limiting factor that reflects back its energy is just the same thing as contradiction. If there is no contradiction, then there is no awareness in that finite. This energy, this returning energy, the reflecting energy from another being is the same thing as a contradictory energy. And as declaration is, and as declaration is only possible where energy is sent out or reflected back, then every declaration is an evidence of contradiction. Now, in the Tao Te Ching, it says that he who does not declare his aim cannot be said to fail. <laughs> <laughs> and William Blake says, he who kisses the joy as it flies lives in eternity sunrise. This is the same statement from different points of view. And a nice little drawing there of Halliday, by Halliday, really late. Like. One of my favourite by him, I think. Right. Any thoughts or questions? Or? Can I go off as a complete tangent?